What a sweet time this morning. Why do we sing songs of redemption? Why do we sing songs that carry a thread of overcoming and victory? Uh, why do we sing songs of a need for a, a Savior's love and a, a need for a Savior's forgiveness and mercy? It's because there are demons of despair and demons of doubt and, and demons of, of, uh, of just this, this, this world of darkness that, that tries to overcome us. And yet we go back to the scriptures and we see throughout the scriptures that there is this redemption thread that shines through where Jesus the Savior and the victor comes and he removes and, and frees us from those fears that try so hard to overcome us. You know, if you think about the Bible, and I'll probably say this again at some other point, but uh, a book that was written over 1,400 years on three different continents, three different languages, by 40 plus authors, most of whom did not know each other. And yet throughout that scriptures, we, we see a singular hero, we see a villain, and we see this redemption. Now we have 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. And so when we come together as the Spirit lights the flame in this church, we get to go back to this, this idea of redemption that has been from the beginning and recognize that Jesus is the one, that he's the one that's come into my life and I hope he's come into your life and he has removed those, those demons and that despair that Satan wants to trap us in. And I, I hope you know that this morning. Productive employee, good. Bluebell ice cream, <laughs> good. I heard a great. How about a basketball going through a hoop? What do we call out? Good, it's good. A kid that cleans his or her room, miracle. No, good, good, right? The mute button on a Zoom call, so good, so good. A 20-minute sermon. Be careful. <laughs> Listen, we make judgment calls every day, don't we, as to what is good, what is great, what is bad, what is evil, and we struggle with that a lot. Uh, we struggle to find truth, especially in this generation. We've talked a lot this morning, even in some, some groups, you know, of how this generation especially is so surrounded by uh, so many different ideas that it's so hard to find the truth. And, and listen, I know that you, you guys have been listening to me for a while now, and, and maybe the preaching is a little bit different from days gone by. Um, it's because times are changing, and, and we've got to dig down into some truth to help a generation that really, really does have a lot of despair that is hanging over it and a lot of doubt that comes against us. And so we, we dig down into these things by even going back to the very beginning to discover where all of this came from. So if you would this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. If you're new to the church, I'm so, so thankful that you're here. New to the faith, so, so glad that you are opening yourself up to learning and figuring out this God thing and who he is. Genesis is in the very, very first part of the Bible. It's actually the first book, uh, chapter 3. You'll find it on the first few pages as you turn there. And as you turn, I'm going to kind of remind us of a few ideas that we've talked through over the last few weeks. God created, he spoke, and it was good. He declared it to be good. There's a reason you see that phrasing in Genesis 1, God defining good. Land and sea, good. Light and darkness, good. Animals, plants, good. Creating humanity, giving purpose, making humanity in his image, and then creating rest, all very good, God defines. And if you remember back from some of the previous sermons the last couple of weeks, we talked about that image of God being created as creative people, as moral people, as eternal people, being in his image, having vision and dreams and hopes. Being in his image means having relationship with him, knowing him personally, enjoying the peace of God's relationship, tending the garden, growing the garden, 
cultivating kingdom culture as we're launching out into life. Here's the deal. God made us adventurers. He made us explorers. Even today, from a microscope to a telescope, we are constantly exploring. We see it in our children as they begin to grow. They learn how to open doors to see what's on the other side because that is in us to be creative and to be adventure wanderers. We are made to live in God's image. Not only that, we are made to live and love God's good. When he declares it to be good, he wants us to fall in love with what that means. But something changed along the way. Matter of fact, if you're keeping notes with me this morning, I want you to write down that sermon title, Something Changed. Something happened to bring evil into our nature. Something happened to bring a distortion to this reality that we know. Something happened to now where we take a look around and we're trying to wrestle with these ideas of goodness and with evil. And here's the idea this morning with evil. We're We're not only open to evil, we're attracted to it. Because of this broken nature in us of what happened way, way back in the garden, we actually have this propensity, this nature within us to shade towards evil a little bit. Where did all this come from? How did all this happen? Genesis 3, chapter 1. I mean, sorry, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, certainly you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering For themselves. We got to pause right there and just determine, let's declare it this morning laundry is of the devil. Laundry's from the fall. If you've had a washer break like we have in the last couple of weeks, we we go back. And this is where it all started having to wash fig leaves every day. This is where it came from. Verse 8 The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God, he called out to the man and he said, where are you? One of the saddest questions in all of scripture, where are you? And then the man begins to speak. And all of a sudden we have the classic, well, you see what happened was. (laughs) And he begins to talk about hearing God in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid. Verse 11, so God asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? There are two particular trees in this garden. If you look at Genesis 2, 9, and even further down in this chapter, verses 22 and uh, through 24, there is a tree of life. It's not really talked about here, but it is in other parts of the creation story. And then you have this tree that we focus in on this morning, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And one of the trees, the tree of life, it represents the goodness of God. You eat from this tree, you eat from these other trees, and you have life. God gives life, and he is going to sustain that life. He is going to provide life for you in the midst of it. As a matter of fact, if you Fast forward into Revelation, you'll see the tree of life makes several appearances again. The goodness of God found in life. But there's this other tree. It's the knowledge of good and evil, and we're told to not eat from it, to trust God. Taking from this tree represents taking on the authority to determine what is good and evil. 
In other words, it's distorting the image that we are created. We are created in the image of God, but when you eat from this tree and you begin to define what is good and what is evil, now you're trying to be like God. Don't take from this tree. Can I ask you a question? You ever thought about this? Why is that tree there? Why even put the tree there? Leave the tree out of the story, and I think we're good, right? But God wants us to love him. And true love, real love, is taking that freedom to choose to love God. The tree here is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to worship. It's an opportunity to say, I believe in the word of God. I believe in the goodness of God. I believe in what God has created for me, for us. And I'm going to go to God and worship him. And I'm not going to partake of anything that would disturb that or take me away from God. So here we have this opportunity to worship, but a voice shows up in the serpent. Now we know this classically to be Satan. It's not clearly defined here that it's Satan, but if you look at Revelation 12, 9, if you look at Revelation 22, we find the serpent of old and he brings a voice of doubt into the situation. He becomes this liar in the, in, in the living and the perfection of the garden. All of a sudden there is a subversion of truth that comes from Satan, the author of all lies. As a matter of fact, it, Jesus calls him just that in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and he is the father of lies. That's how Jesus defines him. They listen to that voice. They take the fruit and all of a sudden their eyes are open. And now everything changes. Everything. Even how they view themselves, immediately it changes. They're like, I'm naked. I, I, I got to go sew together some fig leaves. I got to cover up. Who I am in the image of God has changed. All of a sudden, creation begins to change. How they view creation, this existence that they're in, all of a sudden it is changed because of the disobedience, because of the, the sin, the separation that's come. Their, their very relationship with God has now changed. Something has changed when they take of that knowledge and they're hiding from him now. It all changed. You ever wish that you could go back in time and take back something wrong that you did? You, you ever wish you could go back and take back a word or, or something that you said? You ever wish you could go back and, man, you messed up, you really, really messed up, and, and wish, man, if I could just change that, because you recognize maybe further down the road how it changed the course of things? I picture Adam and Eve as they're walking out of the garden later on in this chapter. You can read, for, uh, read it for yourselves later. I picture them having those emotions. Oh, man, if I could just go back. J just go back to that moment. And I'm, I'd change it all back. I I I'd get back to the way things were. Not, not now, because this isn't how it's supposed to be. I'm sure as Adam and Eve leave, they wish that they would have just listened and just trusted God. Because here's what God wants for us today, for them back then. He wants us to know his goodness. He wants us to be in the goodness of his presence. And so if you're keeping notes with me this morning, I want you to write down finding the goodness of God and write down this little phrase, listen to the right voice. If we're going to find the goodness of God in our lives, we're going to discern which of those voices, there are many around us, that is really, really good. Because Satan comes along and he, he, here's what he whispers, did God really say? Th these tricks that we're dealing with today are not new. They've been around since the beginning of time. Did God, is, is, is this what God really meant? In other words, not only did God say that, but, but maybe he meant it this way. Maybe you're just confused as to what God really means. And this voice of doubt begins to creep up. And we deal with it. I deal with this all the time. These doubts that try to creep into our lives because here's what's happening. Satan is always trying to confuse what is right 
and what is wrong. He's always trying to come in and put separation between us and God. He's trying to change the relationship between us. And so we have to decide this morning that voices are extremely important. The voices that we allow into our lives, we need to take stock of what kind of influence they have. What voices this morning are you allowing into your life that influence your faith, that build it up for something that is good? What voices are you allowing into your life that even decrease your faith, that, that tear it down and try to, to separate? It could be a friend group. It could be some media that you're paying attention to. It, it, it could be some, some uh, ideas that you're consuming voraciously. You know, what is it that's tearing at your faith this morning? And that's why in the church you hear so much importance placed on God's word. If you've been around the church a long time, you probably even get a little tired of hearing it. Read the Word. The Word is important. you got to be in the Word. We preach that a lot. Here's why. Because the closer we draw to the Word, the closer we draw to truth, and the closer we are to God's goodness for our lives. Do you see how that works? So we need to know what kind of voice is speaking into us. The more we allow of God's Word, the more we're allowing God's goodness into our lives. So let's just decide in our hearts this morning that wisdom really is recognizing the truth. Out of all the options that are out there, all the voices that are before us, faith is putting our trust into something or someone that is right. And you've got to find that standard for your life. What is right? And I think that today, if Adam and Eve were here today and, and sharing testimony, they would say, listen to the Word of God. Listen to His voice. Listen to the truth that he brings. Back in anatomy class, remember way, way back when, you may have learned that visually when we take something in through our eyes, we're actually seeing upside down. Because of the curvature of our lenses in our eyes, the images that you're seeing right now coming through are actually upside down. And all of a sudden, the, these images hit the retina and, and go through these fiber optics, if you will, of our system to, to the brain. And the brain looks at this and it, the brain actually recognizes and goes, mm, that's not right. And the brain flips it right side up for us. It changes our perception. It changes what we're taking in. Listen, faith is that filter for our hearts and our souls today. We are, we've got all of these things that are telling us what is true, what is good, what is right, what is wrong, what is evil. And if we're going to figure out what is reality, God's reality in the midst of that, faith is going to be that filter that takes all of these images and voices and flips them and makes them right, makes it where we actually see correctly. Adam and Eve, they listen to the voice of doubt in the garden. They begin to place their trust in something else. And it teaches us today, we've got to be careful with our trust. We've got to be guarding that trust because God wants us to know what is real. He wants us to know what is real love. He wants us to know what is true. This morning, in your very seat, the God of the universe has this strong desire to speak into your life. How do I know that? Because he came and he, he hung on a cross and he died and he took all that brokenness and all those distortions and all those doubts up on himself and came to life again and offers us life. It's through Jesus the Son we know this morning God wants to speak into your life. Find the right voice. Secondly, do this. To find the goodness of God, secondly, we've got to identify temptation. We've got to pay attention to it. We've got to pay attention anytime anything comes along and tries to redefine good and evil. A clicker ought to go off in us whenever we hear things that don't square with what we know of God's truths. We've got to be able to identify that temptation it's, it's, it's lining up to, to destroy us, to bring a different truth into our lives. Satan wants us to have chaos. 
we have to know this morning and trust that God's his commandments and those parameters and all those rules that we read about, those are meant for life. When he begins to instruct us in the way of marriage and he instructs us in our pride and he instructs us in our finances and he instructs us in all of these different things throughout the book, what we have to decide is at the very, very heart of all of those rules is this idea of goodness. God in the beginning said, this is good. I would love for you to have goodness in your life. And so let me help you. Let me show you how. And his presence comes. So we identify any of those temptations that distort and try to change those definitions. I'm reading a book right now called Atomic Habits. It's not a Christian book. It's a secular book, Atomic Habits. And in this book, they tell a story of the Japanese railway system known throughout the world for its effectiveness and its efficiency. It's really, really good, always on time, and the safety of the Japanese railway system is bar none. And if you were to go to Tokyo and to ride those trains, you would see something kind of peculiar. The operators, they will point and call everything that's going on within their systems. So when the train is pulling into the station and the red light is on, the, the operators will point and call out red light. And, and when their speed is slowing down coming into the station or picking up on their way out, they'll point at the odometer and they will call it out. They stand on the platform and they talk about it being all clear. We see a little bit of this at amusement parks when you go and people try to strap you down into a roller coaster and you see thumbs up. But in, Jap in Japan, when, when they do this, they've decided that the security shoots up like 85%. They've reduced accidents uh, exponentially because of this system that they call point and call. Point and call. And I wonder what we would rearrange in our lives if, if we did this for the temptations that came along. If we pointed and actually called out those temptations. Ice cream, lots of calories, fat, right? But what if we actually walked around doing this? We're going down the hallway at work and there's that one of those you know, side conversations going on, if you know what I mean. Gossip, pride, backbiting. This may get troublesome, right? We may get in some trouble here. Pornography. Lust, adultery. What, what would happen for us if we pointed and called out those things that are not right? Man, those temptations would begin to feel really, really strange. The, the truth of God is what we're really, really after when we begin to do those things. And so lastly, I want you to write down this, this idea. Capture thoughts. To find the goodness of God, if we're going to identify those temptations, if we're going to call those things out, if we're going to truly pursue the presence of God in our lives, then we're going to capture those thoughts. Here's what James 1 says, verses 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, listen to the process here. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, sin gives birth to death. That's what sin really is at the end of the day. It's, it's death. It's separation. It draws us away from God's goodness. It draws us out of God's presence. But what James says here is almost every sin originates as a thought. Did you hear it? Temptation. Temptation comes, a voice comes, and it turns things into a thought. We actually begin to think about some alternate ways and some other choices. And these thoughts kind of marinate a little bit in our mind. And if, and if we leave them there, all of a sudden we start attaching emotions to them. So if ice cream is here, and I know that I can't eat a lot of ice cream, but it's here, and, and if I really, really think about that ice cream a whole lot, all of a sudden these emotions start to, to come in, right? And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to feel towards this ice cream. I know this, this ice cream, man, it would sure taste good. It would bring me lots of satisfaction. And so emotions are attached, and all of a sudden fantasy comes. Now we're talking in terms of fantasy. We, we've left 
this, this, this idea of what is right and wrong, what's good and evil here. And now all of a sudden I'm sitting here thinking, man, think about how good this would be. Fantasy. And it turns into desire. Now all of a sudden I'm desiring. And at that point, it's almost a lost cause for me. Because a choice is going to come. And I've got all these emotions attached. And I, now I've spent all this time thinking through and justifying so when the choice comes, man, it's going to take a lot for me to deny. Wise believers, according to the word, they see this process. Today, if you're a believer in the room, God's growing you up. He's giving you some spiritual maturity and he's saying, now, now look at this. Wisdom says, capture those thoughts before they even get to the desire phase. Capture the thoughts. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we demolish arguments we demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Everything that comes against the goodness of God, we're going to destroy those things. How? How do we do that? We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. Every thought becomes obedient to Christ. Philippians calls it having the mind of Christ. So, Early on in the process, when that thinking comes, I begin to capture that and turn it back and say, is this in the goodness of God? And as soon as I can, man, I get away from that thought. I get away from it. If it's against God, i got to get away from it before I start attaching some emotion to it. Before it becomes a desire. Because I'm not strong enough. I'm broken. I go way, way, way back to my great, 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 great grandpappy and grandmammy named Adam and Eve, and I'm broken. So I want you this morning to think for just a second. I hope a mental image comes to mind. What is the prettiest, most peaceful, pristine place you can think of? That place where when you're there, it's just good. It's just good. It may be on a mountaintop, maybe a snowy mountaintop, maybe on a beach, where the waves are lapping up against the shore. It may be on the rolling hills of a pasture. It may be in the middle of Bomb Stadium as the Razorbacks are winning the SEC championship. But that beautiful, pristine, good place. I really do believe this morning. I really do believe this. God wants beauty and peace for your mind. I really do believe that he wants beauty and peace for your heart. I, I believe as I look at the creation story, he really does want beauty and peace and presence with you. I really do believe that God wants you to fully know the Father's love. And I believe that because, again, he came. And he took all that brokenness upon himself. So if we really want God's presence today, we're going to get serious about what Jesus did for us. We're going to get serious about the sin that tries to sneak into our lives. We're going to get real serious about identifying temptation and figuring out the right voices. We won't be in the garden yet. It's coming, but not yet. But we will have faith. And faith leads us to God's presence. And in his presence is all the richness and goodness of God. That's what we desire this morning. Do you have that? Man, if you don't have that, if you have never known Jesus as your Savior, you probably don't know access. You don't know access to the goodness of God. You come this morning. Let me, let me share with you how you can have faith in him. But believer, as we read through these scriptures and as we begin to talk about good and evil and truth and what is right and what is real, let, let, let's begin to identify those voices and temptations and let's begin to capture those thoughts. And let's really, really, let's go after the goodness of God in our lives. He wants it for us. I really do believe he does. Let's pray together. What's God saying to you this morning? What's he want you to do? Did God sacrifice for your sin of 
those sins of old when we tried to subvert and take on his image in a way that we weren't meant to do and we begin to define what is right, what is real, what is good, what is evil, what's, what's wrong. L listen, all that goes way, way back. That, that goes back to this story that we're talking about from the very beginning. We're con just continuing to do that in our own lives. So when we say, have you surrendered your life to Christ? This is what we're really talking about. Yes, God, I believe in your goodness. Yes, God, I believe in my badness. Yes, God, I believe you came and you did something about that. And now I can be changed. I can be what the scriptures call reborn. I can take on the image of God again because Jesus comes to transform my life and make me into something new. And one day he's going to make all this new. I believe that. Have you trusted in Christ that way? Would you come this morning, give your life over to him? If you'll accept him, turn to him, you can leave all those doubts and fears behind. You can come to God. The, the, the Bible says that we will call on his name and he hears us and he will deliver us. If we'll believe it in our hearts and confess it with our mouths, he will give us life everlasting. Would you come this morning and give your life to him? Father, we just thank you so much for today, how you're teaching us through your word. Help us, God, in this place to be discerners. But even more than that, help us to be pursuers of your goodness and your greatness. God, let's, let us get lost in your love. It is overwhelming. It changes everything. Thank you that you give us access through Jesus, your son. And it's in his name that we pray this this morning. Amen.